Praise the Lord, everybody. This is Apostle Chauncey Craig of Discipling Ministries, the place where we're not concerned about a building, but the building of a people. And we welcome you to your midday manner. Amen. And uh, we pray that, 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 that your, your, your ears uh, will be challenged. Amen. And that uh, you will receive uh, the, these seeds, these nuggets, this, this manner uh, that, that, that is fed to us. Uh, so without, without holding the line, um, we have with us today our very own uh, evangelist, a man, uh, you know, as, as we most uh, more affectionately call him, Minister Van Leer. Um, but I introduce to some and present to others, uh, evangelist Marcus Van Leer. We are now in your hand. Amen, people of God. Amen. Amen. Okay, today God has blessed us with a word, amen, straight from the hilltop to heaven. Amen. And I pray that God feeds us. I pray that our hearts are open and our minds are ready to receive. And I pray that our spirits are trembling, waiting for God's encounter to move, because this is, will be an encounter of a divine kind. Amen. Let us pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, you know every ear that's listening, every heart that's beating, Father God, and every spirit that's open like a cup ready to receive, Father God. Father God, we are not only ready to receive, Lord, we're ready for our cups to run over, Lord. Send a fresh anointing, Father God. Speak this word from on heaven, Father God. Send it from on high, Father God. We know that you sit high, but God, you look down low and know how grateful we are for a marvelous master such as our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Father God, who died for us, Lord, so we can be part of the brotherhood, Father God, so we can be joint heirs with him, Father God, in your righteous kingdom. Father God, speak to our hearts, touch our souls, Father God, and while you're looking after us, Father God, you know the prayer concerns that we have, Father God, for our sister, Father God, Louise, Father God. Pray, Father God, that strength can touch her and guidance can trust her, Father God. Your word, Father God, in Isaiah, Father God, chapter 40, verse 31 says, but those who trust in the Lord, and God, we pray that she's trusting in you, believing in you, because when she does, Father God, she will renew her strength, and she will soar on wings like eagles. And she will run and not grow weary, Father God. And she will walk and not faint, Lord. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, Father God, we know that you are sitting on her now, Father God, meeting her very need, Lord. So we thank you, Father God, and we give you praise because you're sitting on Father God. We know that, Father God, you will give her strength because she's weary. And she will, you will give her strength when she feels powerless, Father God. And while you're sitting on her, Father God, bless our beloved aunt, Father God, who went on to be with you in glory, Lord. We pray that her family, Father God, is rested well with peace, God, and knowing, Father God, that you are in control, Father God, and you still have Jesus sitting on that throne, God. We bless your holy hand, Father God, and we bless, we know, Father God, you will console us, Father God, when we come meekly and humbly before your throne of mercy, God. So right now, Lord, have mercy upon us, God. Speak to our hearts, speak to our minds. Encourage us, Father God. Let your Holy Spirit guide us. Teach us. And let it overwhelm us, God, so our lives will be changed, Father God. We pray for every listening ear again, Father God, and we pray that we receive and hear your word, Father God. Give us our marching order. In Jesus' name, God, I pray. Amen. Let's, let us deal with Proverbs chapter 13 today in verse 17. I made a commitment that every morning I will read a chapter of Proverbs according to the date of the month. And Proverbs is a book of knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. And at night I read Psalms so I can give God praise for him helping me think straight during the day. Amen. But if you would turn to Proverbs chapter 13, verse 17, amen, you find these words. A wicked messenger falls into trouble but a faithful ambassador brings health. A wicked messenger falls into trouble, but a faithful ambassador brings health. And I pray, Father God, that you will speak to us now. Uh, if I want to give you a subject to think about, think about a wicked messenger and a faithful ambassador. A wicked messenger and a faithful ambassador. Solomon being a king, he kind of gives us an indication, and I believe that we all, if we've been saved more than five days, understand 
the difference between a wicked messenger that falls into trouble and a faithful ambassador. But what God will have for me to do is kind of give a highlight on the importance of the message that we send. Because as Christians, even Webster defines us as Christians as ambassadors of Jesus Christ. It says that we are disciples of Jesus Christ. It says we are followers of Jesus Christ. And as the followers of Jesus Christ, we are his representations here on earth. Unfortunately, sometimes we, we, we get off, you know, and then so that gives the world a reason to look at us and say, well, I don't want to be a Christian because look at how they act. But we have to be bold enough and upfront enough to say, yeah, I'm a Christian, but I still fall. But that's what grace is for. And without knowing about grace, a lot of folks don't believe that we can be able to bounce back. Because a lot of them believe that we're in the witness protection program, that we can't tell about the life that we had before we came to Christ. And then a lot of us, because we become so just just giddy about being saved, we act like we don't have a life before. So we start turning on friends, turning on family members, and we start trying to sit ourselves on the throne, and we forget we're supposed to be nailed to the cross because Jesus is sitting on the throne. Amen? So a wicked messenger will fall into trouble. Now. When we go to witness, we ought to go because the Spirit leads us. And if the Spirit is leading us, the Scripture says, lead us not into temptation as we pray the Lord's Prayer, but deliver us from evil. But a wicked messenger will fall into trouble when he's not outside, outside, when he's not outside of himself. That's the reason for us coming to Christ, because when we come to Christ, we are new creatures. Old things are passed away. So this newness that I take on is a newness of righteousness. It's a newness of holiness. It's a newness of being an image or taking on the life of Christ. We sing the song, that my life is not my own. To you I belong. One, one, one hymn writer, and a lot of us, we, we don't even know what those are no more. There's this is a thing called hymns from some of us from the old church. We used to sing something called hymns. And listen to what the hymn that's written by Daniel Mark says. Hark, the voice of Jesus calling. Who will go and work today? Fields are white. The harvest is waiting. Who will bear the sheaves away? Let none hear you idly saying, there is nothing I can do. While the souls of men are dying and the master calls for you, take the task he gives you gladly. Let his work your pleasures be. Answer quickly when he call up. Here I am, Lord, please send me. Loud and long, the master call up. Rich reward he offers free. Who will answer it gladly saying, here I am, Lord, send me. Are we really standing up to that? Are we really living up to the request that, Lord, here I am, use me, God. And when God does use us, are we doing it out of sense of obligation? Are we doing it out of a love? for the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. And there's a big difference when we're doing it out of obligation because sometimes we do things, and we've seen it in church. Folk do stuff just because they're there. And then when your heart's not in it, you won't get to this fruit that you think you can get it because you won't find no fulfillment in doing something that you're obligated to do. If you're doing it because your heart is, is destitute on just serving the Lord, and we're giving him all the honor and all the glory, and you want to get out the way, the reward will be unspeakable. We know about bad, bad messengers because if you think about Gehazi in the second uh, king, after, after Naaman was healed of the leprosy, now Gehazi is working for uh, uh, Elisha. So after Elisha gives Naaman the, the call to go and get himself, he gets free. Uh, Naaman wants to come back and say, man, I want to give you something, preacher. You did, man, I ain't, I, I'm back. So he said, man, you can't do nothing for me, but you can give God all the glory. And ain't that wonderful to serve God and get yourself outside of yourself and say, man, as long as God gets the glory, I'm good with that. But because Gehazi, after sitting under this righteous man of God, never got outside of himself, missed it. So he thinks about it. He runs after Naaman and said, Naaman, man, I'll tell you what, man, my preacher was thinking about it. He said, you know, there is something you can give me. So he gives him a little list of what he wants. So the man said, hey, man, that ain't nothing. I'm balling out of control. That ain't nothing. That's chump change. It ain't tricking if you got it. So he goes and gives it to him. When he gets it, he goes back, 
And when uh, uh, Elisha hears about it, sees it, and Gehazi tries to hide it, leprosy comes upon Gehazi. Wicked messenger. He fell into trouble. But a faithful ambassador brings help. Now, think about that. You are representing Christ. And the scripture says in Proverbs 18 and 21, life and death are in the power of the tongue, and those who eat of it will eat of this fruit. Now, think about what happened with Gehazi. Because he spoke that thing, that's what happened. We taught that you will reap what you sow. He sowed this court, so leprosy came upon him. But think about Jesus and his healings in the New Testament. Jesus heals a leprous man. He tells the man in Mark chapter 1, don't tell nobody. Now, here it is, Jesus. Come on now, now. I've got leprosy. Ain't no way in the world I can hold this back. And isn't that the call for us? That when God pulls us out, there ought to be a yearning desire to go and tell somebody. But like I said, a lot of us, because we are uh, 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 so ashamed of what we come out of, some of us are ashamed to even say we're Christian because people know where we come from. But the redeeming power of Jesus Christ to pull you out has to be stronger than what you feel about yourself. Most times we often be in church and the, the call is there, give God some praise. Or someone say, can someone give a testimony? And people say, I don't, God, I don't need, well, he, he woke me up this morning. That ought to be something. That ought to be something for us to be able to say, you know what, God did wake me up this morning. Because you can look at an obituary every, every single morning and his body's in there. Old folks, you saying, I'm glad this was my resting bed and not my cooling bed. You got to be from the old church to get that. So, so God is saying, you know what? What I've done for you ought to be so compelling that it ought to attract people to you. And when they come, don't be shy about giving your witness. Jesus also heals a blind man in Matthew chapter 9, verse 21 through 31. And he tells him, man, don't tell nobody. But this man been blind. He's walking around, now he can see. He can't be quiet. He can't be quiet. I once was blind, but now I see. When we sing the song Amazing Grace, a lot of times we just do a brush, tweet, and stroke over those words. I once was blind. I was so blind that I could not see. And our churches are filled with a lot of blind folk. A lot of our churches are filled with blind folk, having a form of godliness but denying the goodness thereof. Wouldn't that be shameful for us to be able to say, you know what, God delivered me from something. I didn't even know the truth. But now that I have it, my eyes are open. When the scales fall off your eyes and you can actually see, that's a, that's a reason to rejoice. That's a reason to want to tell somebody. But Jesus tells this blind man, don't tell nobody. Tell the leprous man, don't tell nobody. But they can't. Now fast forward, and Jay, Jay walk over to Luke. In Luke chapter 8, we find three compelling stories. The first one is Jesus deals with a demoniac man. So when he comes up, he comes, leaves from Galilee, comes over into the city of the Gadarene, and he meets this man. Now, this guy got an issue. Now, he's tore up from the floor up. Brother man is hit. The demons, the demons that's in his body got him so messed up that he's living in the tombs. He's chained up. He's break free. They lock him back up. Now, he's really messed up. But mind you, he's demon-possessed. He has an encounter with Jesus. The man gets healed, and Jesus tells him, go home and tell of the great things that you see. Now, isn't that something? That's peculiar that God would tell the leprous man, don't tell nobody. Tell the blind man, don't tell nobody. But tell this demon-possessed man, go tell somebody. Go home and tell them. First thing, that's the first place we ought to be able to witness to. And God kind of understands the way culture is today. And that's the indication of when the man gets saved, when the man gets healed, he ought to go home. Because the statistics show that if a man goes back and tells about the goodness of the Lord, tells about how God delivered him, tells him about how he gave himself over to the Lord, 90% of his family will join that church, will come to Christ. And isn't that something? Because the